Okay, so the first thing I do when starting any project is to gather reference. I love using Pinterest for this because it's just really easy to find a good variety of images that fit whatever you're looking for. To organize all my references, I use a free app called PureRef. Uh, it just allows you to arrange images, create notes, etc. And it's just really simple and easy to use. Alternatively, you can also add your images directly into Blender and use them as a reference. Uh, that's great if you want to model directly over an image, such as when you're modeling characters, that kind of thing. Okay, getting started in Blender, first step, always delete the default cube, then add in a default cube and size it into the shape of the hallway. Then I select the end faces and delete them. While modeling, remember to keep your dimensions somewhat realistic. By default, Blender uses meters, um, but you can change the default units over in the scene settings tab. I also like to split my viewport into two views. That way I can see how my scene looks from the camera's point of view while I model. Next, create the camera and position it in the scene. Select the hallway object, tab into edit mode, and separate the faces into a roof, walls, and floor. Then select one of the walls and create some loop cuts that we can use to extrude the geometry into the shape we need by moving them and then extruding the faces. Then just select the extra faces and delete them. Then repeat that for the opposite wall. Next, I want to recreate some details in our reference, like the side molding and the skirting boards. Select the walls, then duplicate and separate them into their own object. Now that the duplicate is separate, you can scale it down, apply the scale, and use the extrude along normals tool to extrude the faces inwards. You can just duplicate this down again to create the side skirts. Smooth things out by adding a bevel to the edge. To make the doors, create a cube and scale it, referencing the camera view and our pure ref board for the size. Select the door and press shift H to hide everything around it. For the details of the door, again, I pulled up a reference image. Let's start with the door handle by creating a plane. Delete one of the vertices and shape it into a handle shape. Then select the mesh and convert it into a curve. Over in the curve properties, first switch the shape from 3D to 2D. Then increase the depth and resolution to a level that looks right. And enable fill caps to close it off. Then add a cylinder and scale it down to create the base of the handle. Then we can position it on the door. For the lock, create a cylinder, scale it down, and bevel the top edge. To create the keyhole, add in a cube and scale it down. Add a boolean modifier to the cylinder and select the cube as the object, then delete the cube. Then position it on the door below the handle. For this bottom plate, just create a plane, scale it down, and extrude it out a bit. For the frame of the door, select the side face of the door and duplicate it, then separate it into its own object. Then extrude it out. You can type in the distance you want to get a precise length while extruding. Then again, extrude it up and across. Select the frame and scale up the width. To create a double door, we can duplicate everything and scale it by negative one to invert it. Then use vertex snapping to snap it to the other door. Next, let's add in a window. Start by adding a solidify modifier to add some thickness to the walls. Add in a cube and scale it up to the size you want for the window. Add a boolean modifier to the walls and select the cube as the object and apply the modifier. Now I'm going to use that cube to create the frame of the window by scaling it down. Then duplicate, rotate and scale it for the second beam, increasing the width. For the glass, select all four corner vertices and duplicate them. Separate them into a new object and remove the solidify modifier. Select the verts and create a face, then position the window into the frame. Next, I'm going to start adding some materials. I recommend using the free Blender Kit add-on. It has heaps of free user-made materials, as well as models and HDRIs. You can literally just drag and drop the materials into your scene as you need. When it comes to choosing which materials to use for your scene, I recommend experimenting with a few to see what looks best. Don't be afraid to mess with some of the values of the materials. You can change up the color with a hue saturation node, increase the scale of the normal map, 
and you can change the scale of the texture to fit your object better if it looks too small or too big. If you add your material and it looks really stretched, it's probably because your UV isn't unwrapped properly. For a simple scene like this, you should be fine with using the Smart UV Unwrap option. However, if you want to learn more about UVs, I'll leave some resources in the description. If the rotation of your material looks wrong, you can just select the face and rotate the UV over in the UV tab. Next, it's time to add some basic lighting to the scene. Even though this scene takes place at night, I want to replicate how the light is casting a shadow of the window into the hallway, like in our reference image. To do this, just create a area light, scale it up, and position it to shine through the window. Then we can lower the beam shape to create a more focused light, which gives us that cast shadow from the window frame. Then we can adjust the power of the light and give it a slight blue hue to make it look more like moonlight shining in through the window. These are the final settings I ended up using. Next, we're gonna model the ceiling light. So create a cube and size it down. Create a couple of loop cuts, size them outwards, then create another two and size them up. Select the middle edges and bevel them in. Create another cube and size it down. Then add a mirror modifier and select the light beam as the mirror object and apply the modifier. Join everything together, then position it on the roof and add a simple metal material. Now for the actual light source, if you're using cycles, you could either use an emission material or you can use an area light. I recommend using an area light because it will give you way better control over the shape of the light and it will also work in Eevee. So create an area light and scale it to match the light beam that we modeled. Like with our window light, lower the beam spread to give the light rays a more concentrated look and play with the power. To make the light look like it's actually being emitted inside a glass tube, we can select these faces of our light model and assign a glass material. Then just move the area light up so that it sits inside the glass of the light model. I always recommend that you add some kind of basic lighting and materials early on when making your scene so that you can see how your scene is looking and understand what needs tweaking to look the way you want. Now that we have our basic hallway modeled, we obviously want to extend the length to somewhat match our reference. So first, select all the objects in our hallway and join them together into one mesh. Then add an array modifier. In this case, change the Y axis to 1 in order to have our object copy over in the Y axis and increase the count to 4. Then apply the modifier. We also want to cap off the end, so just select the edges of our wall and join them up. For the outdoor light, just duplicate it over, but instead of using Shift D to duplicate, use Alt D to create an instance duplicate. This way, whatever value we change on one light will be applied to all the instanced copies. Next, let's add some fog to our scene using a volume. Create a cube and scale it up to cover the entire scene. To hide the cube so that we can still see our scene, head over to the Object Properties tab and under Viewport Display, change Display As to Bounce. Now in the Shading tab, delete the Principled BSDF and add in a Principled Volume Shader. Make sure that you plug the shader into the volume of the material output node, otherwise things are gonna break. The default density is really high, so lower it down to something more reasonable and increase the anisotropy to 0.7. I'm also going to increase the emission by a very small value and add a slight blue tint to the emission color. This just helps to add a bit of brightness and color into our scene. If you want to learn more about volumes and the volume shaders, I'll link some resources in the description. We also want to add a nighttime material to our world. So select the world material over in the shading tab, add in a sky texture node, disable sun disk, set the sun elevation to zero, and change the altitude to 40,000 meters. Then plug the color into the background node and set the strength to something low like 0.05. Next, let's add the actual monster into our scene. A really great free website to find fully rigged free models is Mixamo. You can also upload your own models to Mixamo and rig them really easily. It's just a really great website, especially if you're starting out with 3D. So let's just search for a monster in the characters tab. This one here looks good to me. I like how kind of fleshy it looks. Now we want to find some animations for the character. 
so click on the animation tab and search for zombie. I like how this thriller idle animation looks, it's kind of spooky. So just hit download and make sure to match the FPS of the animation with your scene. In my case that's 24 FPS. Next let's choose a run animation. This zombie running animation looks fine, so download that one as well. Back in Blender let's import the FBX, find the first idle animation we downloaded and hit import. Now we have our model and animation in the scene. Select the armature of the model and move it into the scene. If you need, you can also scale it up or down. I'm also going to duplicate the keyframes of the animation over to last the entire length of our animation. Now with the armature selected, keyframe in the location at the beginning of the animation. Then move forward around 50 frames, keyframe the location again, move forward one frame, and move the armature up the hallway, then keyframe the new location. So now the monster will jump forwards. Then just repeat this a couple times till the monster is close to the camera. Once the monster reaches the camera, we want to switch to the running animation that we downloaded. The simplest way to do this is to first move the monster out the way by placing it outside the scene and keyframing the location. Now it will disappear towards the end of the animation. Next, let's import the running animation FBX. Make sure to copy the scale and transforms of the first model. Then move it into position and add a keyframe for the location where we want it to appear. Move one frame back, place the armature out of the scene, and keyframe the location. Select the keyframes of the run animation and move them up so the animation plays right as the monster appears. Now let's add a simple animation to the camera, position it how you want in the scene, and keyframe the rotation and location. Then move to the beginning of the animation and keyframe the rotation of the camera so that it starts off looking at the ground. With the keyframe selected, head over to the graph editor and adjust the scale of the curves to make the animation nice and smooth. To make this look even better, we can add some camera shake. There's a few ways you can do this in Blender, but my favorite is by using the free Shakeify add-on. I'll leave a link for it in the description. You can just drag and drop the file into Blender and it will install by itself. In the Shakeify options, play around with the different types of shake and the scale and speed. These are the settings I ended up choosing. Then go to the end of the animation, move the camera forwards and add a keyframe. So now the camera slowly moves through the scene. I also wanted to add some big shakes when the monster appears to kind of add some impact to the scene. So I just randomly rotated the camera every couple frames and keyframed it in and it ended up looking pretty decent. Now that the monster and camera are animated, let's make the ceiling lights flicker. To animate the flicker, go over to the power for the light in the light properties tab and insert a keyframe at the beginning of the animation. Then jump forwards about 30 frames, set the power to zero and insert a keyframe. We don't want the power to interpolate, we want it to either be on or off. So in the graph editor, select the keyframes, right click, and under interpolation mode, select constant. Now the light will snap to being either on or off. To make the light flicker, simply move forward a couple frames, keyframe the power back up, move another couple frames, and keyframe the power back to zero. To have the light flicker back on, move another 30-ish frames, and keyframe the opposite of what we just did. You can use the monster animation as a guide when animating the lights on and off. We also want this flicker animation to keep repeating throughout the entire animation. To do this, simply go over to the modifiers tab and add a cycles modifier. Now let's duplicate this light over and select the keyframes of the duplicate light and move them over by about 5 frames. Then just repeat this for the rest of the lights. Now our scene is basically complete, but we can add a few more details to really bring everything alive. Again, I used the free Blender Kit add-on to drag and drop some models in. Adding small details really goes a long way in adding realism and interest to your scenes. With all the details added, this is how our scene looks. And that's the animation all done. Now we can choose our render settings and output location, then hit render. 
For this animation, I rendered it out in PNG because I don't need anything fancy. However, I recommend you look into exporting your renders as other file types such as EXRs. And I don't recommend that you use video formats because if your render crashes or if you need to pause it, you will lose everything. Don't ask me how I know. Now it's time to move on to our post-processing. You can do all types of color correction and effects within Blender's Compositor. It's really powerful. However, I like to use After Effects because that's what I'm most familiar with. If you don't have After Effects, I recommend downloading DaVinci Resolve. It's completely free and is the industry standard for color grading. It's also really good at adding effects and editing your footage. In After Effects, the first step is to import our animation. Go to File, Import, and locate the saved images. Make sure when you're importing that PNG sequence is ticked and create composition is ticked. Then select the first frame of your animation and hit import. Now we can view back our rendered animation. So this looks decent, but we can really elevate it quite simply with some post-processing. First thing I like to do is a simple color grade. So create an adjustment layer, rename it to CC for color correction and add a Lumetri color to it. I don't know anything about color grading honestly, but for this scene, I I bumped up the contrast and exposure and increased the highlights since I felt the scene looked a bit too dark. Next, I added another adjustment layer with another Lumetri color, but this time I added a LUT. LUTs basically hold color information and they're a great way to spice up your scene. If you do a little bit of searching online, you'll find heaps of good free LUTs to use. After trying a few different LUTs, I ended up landing on this one that adds a bluish tint to everything. Next, I created another adjustment layer and I added this CRT preset that I made. This is actually based on this tutorial by this guy. I just tweaked some of the settings to get it looking how I wanted. I'll leave a link for his video down in the description. For the ending jump scare, I wanted the camera to glitch out, so I created a new adjustment layer and added a STV damage from Sapphire. If you don't have Sapphire, you can instead just download a free glitch video, there's heaps out there, and then overlay it on top of your animation. Next, since the scene takes place in this kind of abandoned looking hallway, I wanted to add some dust particles floating around. So I just searched for a free dust particle overlay and downloaded it. To blend it in with the footage, first drag and drop it over the animation, then set the blending mode to classic color dodge. I also keyframed the opacity to go from 0 to 76% so that the dust slowly fades in as the camera pans upwards. I also overlaid a bokeh effect on top. Again, you could search online for an overlay. However, I just used the bokeh lights effect from Sapphire directly on the animation layer. Then I just tweaked some of the values until I got something I was happy with. And as a final touch, I created a new adjustment layer and added warp chroma from Sapphire. This just adds some subtle chromatic aberration to everything. Again, there's plenty of good tutorials on how to add chromatic aberration using the stock After Effects plugins. I just use Sapphire since it's nice and easy. And here's what everything looks like after adding the post-processing. The final step was just adding some sound effects that I put together in Logic, and here's the final result. 